Welcome to Hornbill TV's Prime Time with El Nuli, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope you all are having a wonderful time there. Mm, I think it was during the February elections in Nagaland uh, that we were talking about how some Naga candidates were fomenting communal sentiments against rival candidates. He is from this village, that village, this clan, that clan, this tribe, that tribe, this church that church. So I think we are the only category of Christians that go to church to pray for unity and return home to tell our children not to marry someone from a particular tribe or church. I think we fall into that category. But it's no big surprise. We happen to be a citizen of a country where most leaders love attacking our gods and goddesses, our churches, our mosques and our temples and our caste and tribal status and they attack even our looks. So do you remember the time when a TMC leader made uh, remarks about President Murmu's face? I think you remember that. So uh, I think this is not something very new. Uh, it's not only on Hornbill TV, but if you go to other news establishment websites, uh, NL TV, uh, Global Window, Hornbill TV, and you go to the comment section on each of our videos and news bulletins and shows, if we go to the comments, uh, we see a lot of people giving us very colorful comments, you know, always attacking us. Taila Shukudena, my colleague Atu Jamir, and then Nami, they were uh, you know, feeling a little sad about this. Dress can be complained, Kuri de Naks, Nakan, Shukukan, Kan, makeup, Chuli, Kan, dress can. Nobody is giving us any uh, constructive criticism. Nobody is engaging in the issues that. Uh, they are talking about on television the issues and the concerns of the society stories of the government and everything that is happening around us nobody's engaging in meaningful conversations but they're only attacking our eyes and noses and our makeup and lips and hair and clothes so i think india is a place where toxicity is growing and this toxicity is not just in the casual interactions that we have on social media. It is in our political lives, it is in our economic lives, and especially when we talk of toxicity in the Indian context, I think we are talking more about communalism, where we come from, who, which god we worship, which temple we go to, and which clans and regions we are from. So. Uh, the story for us is basically about clans, about tribes, religions, face, nose, eyes, lipstick, clothes. So that's all we know because that's I believe the reason. Uh, the that's be, I believe the reason why we are toxic because that's the kind of environment that we grew up in. So toxicity comes in many forms, but for India communalism and religious persecution just might be the most common of all toxicities in India. It is without doubt the result of our diversity that political and community leaders often exploit to push communal agendas. We will be talking about this more later on. So let's examine the small aspect of uh, communal toxicity. Uh, which the Supreme Court of India has censured uh, recently. I love the Supreme Court. It is today one of the few remaining entities that makes sense amid the chaos that India has become. The Supreme Court on Wednesday took serious note of hate speech and how religion continues to play a role in dividing the country. Uh, the court is convinced that hate speech will end the very moment politics and religions are separated and politicians stop using religion in their politics and politicking. Hate speech opens an opportunity for people with adverse intention to advance adverse agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, the court said people should exercise restraint from uttering and becoming speech. Uh, a bench of the Supreme Court referred to speeches of um, former Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru and of course Atal Bihari Vajpayee and the court said people from the remote areas 
and nook and corners of the country used to listen to them. So considering records generally, it is easier for people from low income, low education and low development areas to act on communal sentiments more than people from, from the demographic of higher education, urbanized higher middle class uh, uh, people who generally are a little more critical when it comes to absorbing statements from political institutions and leaderships. So anyhow, the justices of the Supreme Court said a serious problem arises when politicians mix politics with religion. Here the court wondered how many people the courts can initiate contempt action against. The bench also asked why rather the people of India can't make a commitment to not vilify other citizens or co communities. Why can't the people just uh, make a promise to themselves and the community not to criticize or demonize or vil vilify people because of their religion? That's what the court is saying. So according to an analysis by the Hindustan Times, um, politicians accused of communal crimes are four times more likely to win an election. The world we live in today is very strange. The media house also stated that more than 50 politicians holding elected office in the Lok Sabha and state assemblies face criminal charges relating to inciting religious violence or stoking communal hatred. This was out of more than 50,000 candidates who had contested uh, elections during the past five years in the country. So candidates accused or convicted of communal crimes win the elections more often than those who have not been charged with any crimes. That's what the analysis found. This suggests that voters see communalism as a reason to vote for a candidate rather than for a political liability. Uh, appealing to social divisions is, for instance, uh, a hallmark of criminal candidates in India. They typically use their criminality as a way to signal their credibility to protect their own community, according to the report. Meaning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the voters see these types of criminal candidates as defenders of their values and agenda. The context of the Supreme Court statement is socio-religious hostility and caste politics. But the meaning applies to any pretext that politicians exploit to secure power to advance their agenda. Uh, it could be the agenda of religion, it could be the agenda of caste, it could be racial. I know a district in Nagaland during the 80s and 90s where candidates fought elections on the basis of their clans. Uh, there was one particular minister in the district uh, decades ago who was elected about five times in a row just because he was from a particular clan in that area. Today we see various manifest manifestation of communal politics in Nagaland. A single village with two village councils, two Baptist churches, two student unions. So that's the kind of Nagaland we have today. This is our fascist phase. Also there are several laws against uh, instigating communal violence or offending communal sentiments. Uh, they are in various sections of the Indian Penal Code as well as in section 125 of the Representation of the People's Act. These laws call against promotion of feeling, uh, feelings of enmity or hatred between communities in connection with an election event. Let's check out another story that the Supreme Court spoke about. The Supreme Court has on Wednesday uh, asked the Home Affairs Ministry to file a report on the alleged attacks on Christians across the country. Uh, they, are all, they are also asked to report the state's compliance with the court's directive. The court has asked for data about the action that has been taken by at least eight states. That's what uh, reports we received here today said. The data is regarding the reg registration of FIRs, status of investigation, 
arrests and charge sheets that have been filed in the incidents that the petitioners alleged attacks uh, targeting Christian communities and institutions. In 2018, the Supreme Court had issued a number of guidelines for the center and for the states to deal with hate crimes. Uh, on January 19, 2022, uh, uh, Forbes reported, a, uh, reported data from the international NGO called Open Doors, which advocates on behalf of persecuted Christians. The NGO's data was about attacks on Christians from across the world. So, according to Forbes, the organization released their annual World Watch list, which assesses 50 countries where Christians face the most severe type of persecution. The newly uh, published data reveals significant changes in the situation of Christian minorities around the world. Uh, according to the study, For uh, Forbes wrote, the persecution of Christians has reached the highest levels since the World Watch List began nearly 30 years ago. Uh, across 76 countries, more than 360 million Christians suffer high levels of persecution and discrimination for their faith, which is uh, sadly an increase of 20 million since the previous year the report that was published in 2022 stated. It is said that about 312 million Christians live in the top 50 countries alone. Uh, one in every seven Christians live under at least, uh, at least high levels of persecution or discrimination for their faith, the Forbes article stated. Simi uh, similarly, in 2019 too, uh, according to a report commissioned by the British uh, Foreign Secretary, uh, Jeremy Hunt, Persecution of Christians, sometimes amounting to genocide, is ongoing in parts of the Middle East and has prompted an exodus in the past two decades. The Guardian also reported that millions of Christians in the region have been displaced from their homes and many have been killed uh, or kidnapped or imprisoned and discriminated against. Uh, the report also highlights discrimination across Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa and in East Asia, which are often driven by state institutions. The inconvenient truth the report finds is that the overwhelming majority, about 80% uh, of persecuted religious believers are Christian. Um, way back in Woka, we used to have a friend who we nicknamed um, Corex. Corex, yeah, because he used to abuse drugs those days. Corex was the name of a drug that users abused those days uh, in Woka, so we named him Corex. The name stuck. The wonderful coincidence today now is that, according to what a friend told me recently, this person whom we named Corex is now a pastor faithfully leading a church in Woka. So that's very nice, isn't it? I know some drugs that drug abusers use those days. I used to smoke weed and do weed, yeah, but no drugs, thankfully. My elder brother used to have this one called Spasmo Proxivan, a little blue capsule that knocked your socks out. This was one of the commonest banned drugs those days in Naglen. Others included uh, a cough syrup called Fencidel, Fencidel, yeah, and then the industrial glue called Dendrite. So even school students used to suck on Dendrite by squeezing the contents out on a piece of cloth. They would then uh, suck or sniff on its fumes through that piece of cloth. Uh, by the uh, by, the time you ha you, you you were done, you emerged looking like an Asian stoop dog. Anyway, the Zinepodo police have arrested a person in Dimapur after raiding a premises linked to what the authorities said was possibly selling drugs illegally. The Zinepodo police raided a place called Mahadev Pharma in Dimapur which the police had reportedly identified as a source of illegal drugs after questioning the accused persons. 
the alleged accused persons namely Manoj uh, Barman was arrested. He was the first one an update from the state publicity services DIPR gave the information today. The authorities then sealed the premises in Dimapur to preserve the evidence. According to the IPR report, the Zinipoto police again seized approximately 11.63 grams of suspected brown sugar from the position of one Viloto Muru of um, Sataka town. He was arrested on March 23rd, the authorities say today. Likewise, on March 23rd, the district's police raided a house at Inavi Colony in Aonato town and seized 730 suspected spasmoproxivon capsules and cough syrups. They have arrested three persons who have been identified as one Atoka Achumi. At Atopa Kiho and Nito Achumi. None of the arrested persons were found to have any license or permits to sell the restricted medicines or any medical prescriptions for its usage, the IPR stated. So during the investigation, it was revealed that the drugs were sourced from a person in Dimapur who apparently ran a pharmacy and sold restricted drugs a non-bail warrant of arrest and search warrant was uh, obtained from the court following which the raid was carried out uh, by the police on Mahade Pharma in Dimapur. This the Zinipoto police identified as the source of the drugs after questioning the accused persons. Uh, the Nagaland police has advised the public not to sell, purchase or transport or use restricted or prescription drugs without advice from medical pra practitioners. Pharmacists and chemists are also warned that prescription drugs should not be sold without medical advice. Doing otherwise is a contravention of the NDPS Act and other le legal provisions which may result in not only criminal action but also cancellation of the license the IPR report said. Those were the stories for today, ladies and gentlemen. Keep supporting Hornbill TV and keep watching us. We'll be bringing you more news later on. I'm Al Muli. See you next time.